went to Valdosta State University and started working on a degree that I never finished at Valdosta State on speech and communications. And one of the things that I wanted to learn was not just the forms of communication that I learned in Bible college for preaching and things of that nature, but I wanted to learn how to speak cross-culturally as I did missions. I wanted to learn how to speak to the man in the marketplace. One of my professors at this wonderful college that I attended, I remember she started off the class that we did on intercultural communications, and she quoted the famous journalist Edward Murrow. How many of you remember him? Yeah, a lot of you do. Murrow said, to be persuasive, you must be believable. To be believable, you must be credible. And to be credible, you must be truthful. And that's how she started that class. Because if you are credible, if you are truthful, then you can begin to cross whatever boundaries in communication culturally, you can begin to cross whatever boundaries in communication where you don't know the language and you're using perhaps a, a, uh, an interpreter like I did so many, many times. And your stories will be believable. There's nothing that you possess. There's not one thing materially speaking, monetarily speaking. There is nothing that you possess that is more powerful and more influential than your own personal faith story. We're going to talk for the next few weeks about credibility. Credible is the series title that we've elected to call this series as we sit around talking about it. We're going to talk about today, is the Bible credible? Can you trust the Bible? Especially when you're talking to people who have had, in our culture and in Western culture in particular, they've had their faith in the Bible attacked day after day after day our students in schools, our children in universities, people, whether it's on the news, whether it's on social commentary, the Bible is constantly being attacked. Even international magazines like The Economist just recently carried an article on Christianity and the Bible's influence on Christianity and how it affects politics. One of our politicians recently said, if evangelicals who have a reputation for believing the Bible if evangelicals just realized how much power they wielded as a voting bloc, they could change the course of the nation. And if that statement by the politician is true, then I wonder why we don't. And I wonder at times if we say we believe the Bible, but as one Christian author wrote a few years ago, we say we are Christians, but we live like atheists. And so in this series, Credible, I want to persuade you on why you should live like the Christian that you are and that God has called you to be. And if you're not a Christian and you have questions about the Bible, and next week when we talk about is it credible to believe in God, and the week after that when we talk about is it credible to believe in Jesus, I mean, the virgin birth, his sinless life, his miracles. His atoning death for us at Calvary, the resurrection and Jesus' return. Is it credible in the time and the age that we live in to still believe what we believe? Is it credible to believe in miracles? So we're going to start where we always start at Woodland. If we have a question, we simply ask ourselves, what does the Bible say? So would you stand with me this morning and let's go to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Why don't you read this out loud with me? All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong, and it teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. And then let's read Psalms 119 and verse 86 together. All your commands are trustworthy. Let's say that again. All your commands are trustworthy. Lord, I so want to be that credible person that Edward Murrell talked about. But Lord Jesus, it is so easy for me to see my flaws. And so my prayer as I come to this pulpit again, my prayer 
Lord, just for the benefit of those who are listening, for every meeting or everything that I do in life, it's, Lord, speak through me. Let my words, let my thoughts, let my meditations all be shaped by this precious, God-breathed, God-inspired word that you have given us that we call the Bible. So I pray now, give us open hearts and open minds. May we not be like the skeptics that Jesus talked about that could never be persuaded, who kept coming up with more questions and more questions And Jesus finally said, you hypocrites, you can make a decision by whether the skies are fair or whether the skies are not fair, but you refuse to hear the word of the Lord. Help us this morning, and may I be faithful to preach the word of the Lord. And when this message is over, may we walk out of here going, yes, the word of God is credible, for it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. You may be seated. The Bible is the most read, the best-selling, and the most translated book in the world. It still remains that. And that's an amazing statement to make about a book as old as the Bible. The most read, the best-selling, and the most translated book in the world. When we read that passage just a moment about inspired, we're literally saying that God breathed out his word. God breathe this word. I'm speaking now, and it's my breath coming over my vocal cords to create words that you can understand, whether here in this sanctuary or online this morning. I've got here two Bibles. The bottom one is my daddy's Bible. It's worn. It's marked up. It's got notes in it. It's extremely precious to me because even as a boy, I remember my daddy reading this Bible and opening it in his lap and laying, and Daddy often read like this when he was reading, and he would just read and he would pray. He would read and he would pray, and this is Becky's father's Bible that I have right here, and you can see it's worn, it's marked, and it's full of notes as well. When I think about our dad's praying, my dad was not a pastor, Becky's dad was a pastor, but when I think about two men from two different walks of life, from two different sides of the continent that we call the United States. When I think about my my father-in-law being an orphan, my dad growing up and his daddy dying when he was six and and, and being the one that would, would stay at home and eventually grow up and pay off the family farm and work it, I think about how different their lives were and yet how they were both shaped by the same book and because of their faith It eventually led to Becky and I meeting and becoming husband and wife. I was recently a part of a service where it was mostly pastors. It was probably close to a thousand pastors, and I'd been invited to come. I knew the guest speaker for this plenary service and wanted me to be there, and so I was there, and the soloist sang the most wonderful song about the Word of the Lord. It was a beautiful old hymn. But as I looked around that crowd, and it's strange now to be one of the oldest people in the building. Do you understand what I'm saying? I've always been used to being one of the youngest people and then being one of the average age. But now being one of the youngest people, oldest people in the building, it's kind of weird feeling. But I understood the song, but I saw all of these young pastors looking at each other. They were yawning. They were bored. They didn't have the background to understand all that she was saying. And I remember thinking to myself, a much better selection would have been a song. Not that she did a great job. It was a great song. And not that I'm smarter than the people who helped her pick it out. But in my opinion, and my opinion counts too. Can you say amen to that? Your opinion matters. I thought a much better song, if you want to correct, connect with this generation that I'm sitting here with would have been a song I grew up on, and if you know it, sing it with me. The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Next verse, God's Word shall never fail, never fail, never fail. God's Word shall never fail. Say it with me. No, no, no. Now, I promise you they would have understood that one. The other song was kind of complicated. 
And you can't say what I've said of any other book than the Bible. It's the most universally trusted book. It's the most culturally relevant book. And when I say culturally relevant, understand how it crosses cultural generations and cultural boundaries. I'm privileged to be a part right now of a, of a team of people that are equipping pastors in Mongolia where the gates of hell are beginning to creak and tremble as the church, though it's still fledgling, is growing and planting churches. And we're figuring out how to teach the Bible so that it can be taught cross-culturally and how to pastor. I'm so honored to be a part of that, but I'm amazed that this book is still touching generations later and later because it is the inspired, it is the God-breathed Word of the Lord. It is not just literature. It is God's Word living among us. Can we give Him a hand of praise for that today? So some of the criticisms that we hear sometimes is that the Bible historically is not accurate, but that's not true. Historically, the Bible is accurate, not just in doctrine, but the Bible is accurate in every area of life because God's Word cannot lie. The Bible says in Hebrews 6 and verse 18 that it's impossible for God to lie. There is a reason that the universe works. There is a reason that the laws of nature do not fail. They work every day. You get up depending every day of your life. You go to sleep every day of your life depending upon the laws of God to work. This was not just some cataclysmic accident that created the unique you that you are and the animals and the cosmos and the laws of the universe. It all works because God put it together, this divine creator of ours. The Bible says in Psalms 33 and verse 4, for the word of the Lord holds true and we can trust everything he does. That's why the universe works. The Bible is filled with eyewitness accounts of people who actually saw. We have trials today with juries, and we bring in eyewitnesses that can tell what they saw. Archaeology continues, and I remember the first class I took in biblical archaeology and how fascinated I was by it. And occasionally we would come to something that the Bible told us, but we weren't sure yet archaeologically. We believed the Bible, but we weren't sure yet archaeologically because we hadn't made those discoveries yet. And so there were certain archaeologists that would question, for instance, was there ever a Hittite empire? Well, finally, an archaeologist discovered the capital of the Hittites and over 400 clay tablets. And now you can go home to Wikipedia and you can read all about the Hittite empire. There were people who used to deny the existence of Solomon and used to deny the existence of David. And yet archaeology continues to prove that the word of God is true. Listen to me, friends. When it comes to history, God has never lied. The Bible was copied with extreme care. Letters were numbered. Columns were measured. Everything was taken extreme care. And if one single letter, let's say the central letter of the Torah was found to be out of place, the scroll was destroyed, you still will not find anyone who treats the word of the Lord with more respect than the Jewish people do as they bring in the Torah, as they lay it on their pulpit, as they kiss it, as they refuse to touch it, as they point word by word with a pointer. And you and I sometimes so cavalierly treat the Bible the way we do. God's Word historically is accurate. Scientifically, the Bible is accurate. I love what Johannes Kepler said and Melissa Kane Davis, Tra Melissa Kane Travis has a wonderful book out about Johannes Kepler if you ever want to read it. But Johann Kepler said that science was just simply thinking God's thoughts after him. Now, I love science. I'm a big believer in science. Theology, listen to me, theology gave us science. You've heard me say that perhaps a hundred times or more since I've been the pastor at Woodland Church. Because I want you to understand that what gave rise to modern science was not 
Look, religions of this world, science didn't give rise to science. Theology birthed science because we knew historically the Bible was true. We knew that God could not lie. And we knew that the laws that he created the universe with, they always work. Science constantly changes. If you were to take my 12th grade science textbook and try to introduce it into a class today, you would be laughed at because it's obsolete. Say that word with me, obsolete. And perhaps nothing changes faster in textbooks than science because science is continually making new discoveries. God understands stuff that we don't understand yet. God sees things that he's created that we haven't seen yet. And the laws that he created, just like they're unchangeable, God's word is unchangeable. His truth abideth forever. In Psalms 148 and verse 5, the Bible says, Let every created thing give praise to the Lord, for he issued his command, and they came into being. He set them in place forever. Say that word with me. Forever, and it is to emphasize it, psalmist wrote, and ever, his decrees will never be revoked. God understands the laws of the universe when we don't. Let me re go back to Johannes Kepler just again. Kepler said this, <clears throat> My Lord and my Creator, I would like to proclaim the magnificence of your works to men to the extent that my limited intelligence can understand. Thomas Edison, that we all are familiar with here in Detroit, my utmost respect and admiration to the, all the engineers, especially the greatest of them all, God. Robert Millikan, who won the Nobel Prize in the last century, said, I can assert most definitely that the denial of faith, the denial of faith lacks any scientific evidence. In my view, there will never be a true contradiction between faith and science. Alan Sandage, who won the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in astronomy, who gave his heart to Christ in 1980, said, I was raised practically an atheist in my childhood. Science was what led me to the conclusion that the world is much more complex than we can explain. I can only explain the mystery of existence to myself by the supernatural. Friends, it's amazing the more I read how many scientists are coming to faith and shaking off this atheistic mindset that says there can't be a God, that this is all just accidental. The universe is too complex, and God's Word has never been dated. You've heard of the flat earth theory. The church, nor did the early Christians believe that. There were some people that did, and the Roman Catholic Church believed that for a while, but they didn't base that upon the Word of the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 22, God sits above the circle of the earth. And by the way, that word circle in Hebrew, lest you think it's two-dimensional, that word actually means sphere. Say that word with me. Sphere, like hemisphere. It's a sphere. God sits above the sphere of the earth, and the people below seem like grasshoppers to him. Let's move on to Job chapter 26 and verse 7, the oldest book in the Bible. How did Job know this except God inspired these words to him? God stretches the northern sky over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. The ancient Hindus believed that the world was flat and that it sat on the back of elephants. And the elephants stood on the back of giant sea turtles. And the turtles just kept going down, down, down. It's why one little boy came home and explained what he learned in science that day to his mother is, turtles, turtles, turtles. Friends, the word of the Lord that is so ancient has never been proven untrue. There were those in the Greeks and in the Romans who said the stars could be counted but Jeremiah long ago said, the stars of the sky cannot be counted. There was a time when we believed that sickness was in the blood. And so our first president died prematurely because he kept getting sicker, so they kept bleeding him to death until finally they literally bled George Washington to death. They didn't understand that life is in the blood. When people get sick today, we don't bleed them, we give them blood. And the Bible says this, 
The life of the body is in the blood, Leviticus 17, 11. The Bible understood quarantine in Leviticus 13, 14, when 13, 4, when somebody was sick, quarantine the person for seven days. I love what Proverbs 30 and verse 5 says. Would you read this with me this morning? Proverbs 30 and verse 5. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to all who come to him for protection. And then look at Psalms 12, 6, and let's read it together. The Lord's promises are pure, like silver refined in a furnace, purified seven times over. You could translate the word pure as trustworthy. You can write that out into the side of your outline if you'd like. It's trustworthy. Thirdly, this morning, not only historically is the Bible accurate, not only scientifically is the Bible accurately, but prophetically the Bible is accurate. This is a huge point because the Bible is filled with thousands of prophecies. And the likelihood of those prophecies coming true is astronomical, impossible, many would say. There are over 300 prophecies. Listen, over 300 prophecies about the birth of Christ and the death of Christ, his birthplace, his ministry, over 300 of those prophecies in the Bible, and yet every one of them came true, just about the birth and the life of our Savior. Now imagine if I was to take a sheet of paper this morning and cut up it to 50 pieces and pass it out to 50 people in this room and say, would you please put this together, and when you hand it back to me, I expect it to be in the shape of a U.S. map. Just randomly, by the way. It's not going to happen. One year I was preaching on this subject, and someone that week had listened. This is before we were on uh, live streaming. They listened online, and they came and met with me and says, well, a clock could come together. It could accidentally come together. And I said, well, just show me where any scientist has said that a wristwatch could accidentally come together. They said, I can't, but I believe it. Friends, listen to me. That's called blind faith. We have real faith. For faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of the Lord. Can you say amen? And notice that the Bible says, faith comes. Some of you, your faith is increasing right now. Some of you, you're wrestling. You may be challenged with what you're hearing right now. But there's a crack in your reserve. There is a crack in what you have held on to because you've wanted to believe that the Bible can't be true, that God has no authority in your life. But suddenly you're coming to the realization because you're hearing the word of the Lord. Faith is knocking on your door this morning. And prophetically, the Bible is true. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21, no prophecy ever originated from humans. Instead, it was given by the Holy Spirit as humans spoke under God's direction. Look with me at Matthew 26 and verse 56. But all this is happening to fulfill the words of the prophets as recorded in the scriptures. Amazing stuff. When you look at it, I would take you this morning, if you want to read a book, I think is one of the most enlightening books to read would be Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. When you read that, you'll just walk away, and some people would say, well, your mind blown, just because as you read this book and you see how accurate prophetically the Bible is, how accurately literature it is. It'll just blow you away. Number four, and this is one of my favorite points, the Bible has a miraculously unified narrative that leads to Jesus. A miraculously unified narrative. I mean, the book, just look at me for just a minute. This book is unified from Genesis to Revelation. From Genesis to Revelation, and it points to Jesus in every book and every chapter. There's 66 books in this Bible. There are over 40 authors, and it was written over a period of 1,600 years. It was written in over a dozen countries and on three continents and in at least 
three different languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. It was written by farmers, kings, soldiers, shepherds, princesses, priests, historians, fishermen, tax collectors, scholars, businessmen, and doctors. It was written from various places like caves and ships and prisons and palaces and deserts. It's one story, one book, without a single contradiction in it. It's an amazing gift of God to you and I today. That's what this book is all about. No other book can claim that. The Bible says in Luke 24 and 27, Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, we're talking about the Old Testament, and explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And the star of the Bible is Jesus. Say his name with me. Jesus. Say it again. Jesus. Look at your neighbor and say once again, I speak the name of Jesus over you this morning. Jesus is the star of the Bible. There used to be an old rock and roll song that says, you can be the star of my show anytime. And I would, some of you are nodding your heads already. <laughs> I look at Becky and still sing that. You can be the star of my show, but Jesus is the star of our lives. Can we give him a hand of praise this morning? Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. For the theme of the Bible, the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation, from the time Adam and Eve sinned till Jesus comes again, has been the salvation and the redemption of human beings like you and me and our friends and our relatives and our neighbors and even our enemies. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And so Jesus said to these scholars who could not be convinced. They kept coming up with question after question. They were skeptics. You know those kind of people. I know those kind of people. You can share with them what I'm sharing with you this morning, and they'll still yell, but, yell, but, yell, but. It's a friend of mine in our congregation that talks about the yell, but birds. They're just yell, but birds. Jesus says, you know, you, you're being hypocrites. You make decisions but you don't want to make a decision of what to do with Jesus. I'm asking you to make an honest decision of what to do with the Bible this morning and what to do with the Bible's message about Jesus. If you're going to reject it, you have to reject it on a lie or that you just simply do not want to know God. But don't pass on a lie about this book that so many people do who, number one, most don't understand archaeology, most don't understand science, most don't understand history, most don't understand literature, and most have never taken the time to study culture. Jesus says, you search the Scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. Read this with me. But the Scriptures point to me. Number five, culturally, the Bible is trustworthy. Now, this is where the rubber meets the road. Because every once in a while, when I'm in conversation with someone, they've had someone tell them about how Christianity has been an oppressor, and the Bible talks about oppression of women, the Bible talks about oppression of minorities, and when I sit down with them and have the chance for people that will listen and let me go through the Bible with them, they'll find out that the American and British form of slavery and the Dutch form of slavery and Belgium form of slavery, the Bible nowhere condoned that. In the slavery that is talked about in the Bible, and I don't have a lot of time to go into this, but would you just listen carefully for just a moment? And you can really, this is easy to follow up on. You can go to sites like Christianity Today, Belief.net. There's so many sites that will just help you understand what I'm going to say even at a deeper level. In those days of the Bible, you couldn't tell the slave from anybody else. They dressed the same. They wore the same sandals. If you were wealthy, you wanted your slave to dress wealthily. The slaves were doctors. They were lawyers. They were, they were people that you trusted the care of your children to. Matter of fact, they could be set free after so long. Matter of fact, many of them were, became slaves voluntarily because it was a way like some of our ancestors did who came to Georgia from debtors' prisons. They came to Georgia voluntarily to, to conquer the, the swampy coastlands of Georgia and move inland because they were debtors and couldn't pay their bills. 
Many became slaves because they wanted to move up in life from the station of life that they were in and actually becoming slave to a wealthier person helped them to move up in life. It wasn't the type of whip and the prejudiced slave labor where we talked about black people as not having souls and black people who not being, that they were judged because of Ham's sin. None of that is in the Bible. But culturally, whether you go to Africa, and I have been so honored to preach and teach the Bible among so many cultures. I have sat on dirt floors and grass huts in Asia and in Africa. I have preached in universities throughout Europe. I preached in universities in Africa and South America. I preached to Indian tribes in the jungle of, of South America as well as the major cities of South America. Friends, culturally, the Bible is so relevant because the Word of God is supernatural. It penetrates people's heart. It convicts people's heart. And they voluntarily decide to follow Jesus Christ. No one coerces them. No one puts pressure on them. They just voluntarily, once they understand the amazing message about Jesus. Look at Luke 24, verse 25 with me this morning. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering His glory? And then Jesus took them, once again, through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from the Scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, why is this verse there? Now, listen, this is important. Because here were two Jewish men who had been hoping that Jesus was the Messiah. They were hoping that Jesus would establish the kingdom right then. Do you remember when we prayed this morning, we talked about, as Christians do, we pray what Jesus taught us to pray. Say it with me. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Say it again. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And sometimes we project what we want upon the word of the Lord rather than allowing the word of the Lord to project God's truth upon us. And so they were projecting their desire for the Romans to be kicked out and for Israel to become what it was under David and Solomon once again, a global power. But Jesus said to them, you are so foolish, your hearts haven't believed. And so as he walked with these two Jewish men on their way to Emmaus, he opened up the Bible and helped them to understand the things they had missed, that it had been prophesied that the Messiah would suffer and die for our sins and for our redemption, and suddenly their eyes were opened. Let's ask the Holy Spirit daily, Lord, incline my heart to your word, because there are days I'm not inclined to your word. Lord, open my eyes to your word, so that I may behold wonderful things. And Lord, satisfy my heart with your word, as the psalmist said, because I'm so easily satisfied with the trivial things of life. And Lord, transform me by your word. Somebody say amen this morning. This is what it means to have a, a Bible that is culturally relevant. And then finally this morning, before we do our growth work, the Bible, if you'll allow it, will transform your life. It's transformed cultures. It's what broke the back of European slavery and American slavery as we knew it. Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 31, he said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now some of you, those of you online, those of you here, you may not have known the first part of this verse. I can promise you, you knew the second part of this verse because the media quotes it and yet the media is so untrustworthy today, their, their credibility scale has plummeted. That's been true for quite a few years now because media has become as sectarian as politics are. We're suffering a credibility crisis in America across professions. People arguing with their doctors, people arguing with their politicians, people arguing with their bank. Who do you trust anymore? But Jesus says, you will know the truth, look at me, don't miss this, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free if you remain faithful to live out the truth. 
Friends, the Bible will transform your life. And if you let the Word of God transform you, you will be free indeed. Can you say amen? Would you look at your growth work this morning? Because here's the question that this whole message is going to go towards this morning. Who's going to be the final authority in your life? I mean, when it comes down, I say it so often because it is at Woodland. If we have a question, where do we go? We go to the Bible to see what it says. This evening in 201, I will be teaching different habits that we maintain in our lives to, to grow in the Word. One of those, as Pastor Corey said in the announcements, is, is how to study your Bible, how to read your Bible, how to make notes in your Bible. We'll be talking about how to pray. We'll be talking about what it means to meditate or reflect, and I hope that you'll come. If you, even if you took it 20 years ago, 10 years ago, get a refresher as someone did in our Discovering Woodland last week. And if you haven't signed up yet, that communication card, just give it to one of the ushers or stop it off at the communication desk and say, I'd like to take 201 tonight if you've taken 101, Discovering Woodland. You need to take that class first. But you're asking the question this morning, am I going to personally trust the Bible? That's the question. Will I personally trust God's Word? Will it be the final authority in my life? You see, growing up as a Pentecostal, and I am so grateful for that, and believing in all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, I'm so grateful for that. I've heard so many people say things supposedly by the Spirit that are not of the Spirit at all. Years ago, somebody got mad as a wet sitting hen with me because they stood up and said, the Holy Spirit had told them, my dear little children, my dear little white children. So I corrected them. That's not the way the Holy Ghost talks. Red and yellow, black and white, we are precious in His sight. Can you say amen? I can tell you stories that would make the hair stand up on the back of your head. It's never made me doubt the gifts of the Spirit. It's never made me doubt the work of the Holy Spirit. But it has drove me deeper and deeper into the Word so that we can discern and judge what is of the Spirit and not of the Spirit. Does that make sense? And so you have to personally trust the Bible. I love what Luke 24 and verse 32 says. If you will personally trust the Bible, those of you listening online or watching, listen to this. This is powerful. This is so beautiful. I, I could just preach one message on this. I could preach a series of messages on this. When he talked with us along the road and explained the scriptures to us, didn't it warm our hearts? Didn't it warm our hearts? Nothing will thaw a cold heart. Nothing will warm a stone hard heart. Nothing will melt a heart like the Word of God when we pray, Lord, incline my heart, satisfy me, open my eyes to the Word of the Lord. Do you need a warm heart this morning? Do you need a compassionate heart? Do you need a loving heart? Do you need a brave heart? Nothing will warm your heart more. Stand with me if you would this morning. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Would you read this out loud with me this morning as we stand in God's presence? Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think, and then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Say those three words with me. Good, pleasing, and perfect. Look at your neighbor and say, God's will is good, God's will is pleasing. God's will is perfect. Look at me. God's will is good. Say it back to me. God's will is pleasing. God's will is perfect. I love nothing more than good, pleasing, and perfect. Amen? Isn't that exciting? Good, perfect, pleasing. Somebody say, come on, victory. Hallelujah!
Inside, I'm being a little bit Pentecostal right now. Good, pleasing, and perfect. That's what the will of the Lord is. So let the message about Christ and all of its richness fill your life. So, Father, I pray over us all this morning. I pray that we will understand that the attacks that come upon your word, that, Lord, they come from the father of all lies, Lucifer himself. They come not necessarily from people, Lord, who are the devil, but they come from people that, as your word says, the enemy has blinded them. Or they're skeptical and just, they specialize in skepticism. They're never able to make a decision. But may we remember the words of the scripture and the words of scientists and historians and professors who've all professed their faith in you. Incline our hearts to your word. Open our hearts to your word. Let us not be satisfied with the lies of this world, but let us be satisfied with the word of the Lord. And let the word of Christ dwell richly in us. While your heads are bowed and every eye is closed, if you've had trouble believing the word of the Lord or standing on it. Would you just lift up your hand and say, Pastor, I needed this message this morning. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Yes. Yes. Don't be ashamed of that. We live in a world constantly where we're being attacked like that. Now let me talk to those of you that maybe you have wandered from your faith. Maybe you have never committed your life to Jesus. I want you to know there's nobody that God loves more than you. And God won't love you more if you give your heart to him that he loves you right now. He gave his son for you. And I pray this message this morning has touched your heart in such a way that there's a stirring in you. You feel drawn to Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit calling you. That's the Holy Spirit drawing you. So would you pray this prayer with me this morning? Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sins. And I confess to you that I am drawn to him today. I know that I know, somehow or another, I know inside that Jesus lives. And as much as I know how, I'm trusting you to forgive me of all my sins and to give me a fresh start in life. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said, amen, amen, and amen. If you prayed that prayer, I pray that you'll let me know. If you prayed that prayer here at Woodland, I pray that you'll drop, stop by our connections desk. We've got a gift that we want to give you. And I want to send you forth with this blessing from Psalms 121 and verse 7. The Lord keeps you from all harm. The Lord watches over your life. The Lord keeps watches over you as you come and go, both now and forever. And so until we meet again, the Lord watch over you and keep you in Jesus' name. God bless you. You're dismissed this morning.